I'm gonna talk about inside boxing. I'm gonna do a whole tutorial video on some different concepts, things that you need to know as a beginner, intermediate, and maybe it might be a hole in your game right now if you're advanced. I got my list right here to make sure I don't leave out any of the essential points I wanna go over. Of course, there are many more points beyond the ones I'm gonna talk about in this video, but I just wanna make sure I touch on the basic foundational ideas, concepts, and things that I've used and seen work for people time and time again, no matter how strong they are, no matter how fast they are, no matter how tough they are, no matter how athletic they are. All right, because again, like I mentioned in the defense video that I did, uh, some different drills to do with that, that that's how I approach coaching, is, is how can I coach somebody and give them tools that are gonna work the majority of the time for the majority of people, and then off of that, then you can add your own little nuances to it, all right? So let's jump right into it. Inside fighting, where I see most people run into problems with this, and this is actually all levels. Obviously, beginners are have the hardest time with this, but this is all levels. I can think of so many fights at a high level where you see this happen just because someone's not equipped to fight on the inside or they haven't practiced it and really spent a long time working on it. It's not just a few training sessions to work on this stuff. It's not just a month to work on this stuff. Sometimes it's years to work on this, all right? But the first thing that I see that eliminates someone from even getting to the dance of the inside fight are these fallacies, all right? falling in as they're attacking. So they're attacking and they're leaning forward, which therefore makes it easy for their opponent to nullify them even attempting to get on the inside, all right? Because a lot of times in a fight, when you're gonna fight on the inside, perhaps the other person doesn't wanna fight on the inside, right? That's the most ideal picture, right? If I'm boxing you and you don't wanna box on the inside, you wanna box on the outside, and I wanna get on the inside, you're not used to it, and if I can get there and stay there, it's my fight, all right? Styles make fights, right? So the falling in, then, Honestly, I see people do this all the time, grabbing. So they themselves are not consciously, they're consciously like, I wanna get this person on the inside. I'll tell a guy in a fight, get on the inside, get in close and work. And they'll grab, they'll reach out, they'll extend their arms out for a few different reasons. One is when you're coming in quick sometimes, especially if you're overstepping, you wanna keep your steps nice and small, about five, six inches. If you leap, all this stuff is worse. That's what's, that, what's gonna make you fall in. It's gonna make you reach out to support your body, to stop you from you know, face planting as you come in and reaching out, honestly as well, sometimes to feel like you're gonna hold somebody in position. And while that can be an actual tactic that is used, too often, like I said, with kind of beginner and intermediate boxers and all level boxers, that ends up leading into what? You getting tied up. Your hands are out, you get tied up, or you get hit reaching out too. But more often than not, you get tied up, shut down, zeroed out, and the ref comes in to break it, separate, and now you're back to not the inside, but to the outside. Now you gotta start everything else again. Then the last thing as far as your, your ways of entry that lead to you not being able to even be an inside fighter, unless you're boxing in Mexico where not everybody nowadays, but a lot of people in Mexico, I know from experience, they just, they'll just hang right there with you on the inside, right? But uh, assuming that's not your situation, is you, when you come in, you get square, right? If I come in and I'm sided up, I have space to throw punches naturally. If my shoulder is up against you, I have some space to at least throw some right hand punches. If I end up chest to chest on you, I have zero space to throw punches. The definition of smother. Think about when you're entering, right? I said, don't overstep, don't leap in generally because it will smother yourself, generally. Not all the time, but generally. All right, I just wanna be really precise in how I say this. But then also, think about this as well, gang. If you're coming in with wide hooks, or hooks even, nice crisp hooks, right? But you're coming in with those hooks. That's gonna lead you to be a little bit more square, typically. Gonna end up with that chest to chest slam into each other and make it easier for you to get tied up and shut down kind of that perfect inside range that you want. And, uh, but if you come in with jabs, double, triple jabs, you're naturally having an arm that's extended, that is a barrier. It's, it's a 
pole in between you and your opponent. So therefore, when you get closer and closer and closer, particularly also if you're jabbing at their chest area, not up here where they slip it and you can smother yourself easily and get too close, right there, it's gonna stuff, stuff that a little bit and keep you at a little bit of a range. So even if you are slightly leaning in and things like that and having a lot of momentum, you won't get so close, you just smash chest to chest. All right, makes sense? And then last, if you just come in with straight punches, right? Doesn't have to be double triple jab, but those are the greatest. But you're coming in with like a one, two, one, two, one, two type thing, all right? Again, same thing, straight shots. It's gonna be harder for you to smother yourself. If you come in wild and crazy with hooks, it's gonna be a little easier to smother yourself. And then of course you get caught coming in, right? But that's another story. Uh, these are just really big points that you change this simple thing about your game, it will allow you to get on the inside more, all right? Because if you wanna be on the inside, I, I, you probably don't get there as much as you want to, and these might be some of the reasons why, all right? So we, we're working on showing up to the party. So we, we showed up to the party. Uh, let's talk about when we're in the party. So we're in the party right now. We wanna make sure we stay relaxed, all right? Uh, the biggest thing, I remember one of my boxers right now who's an undefeated pro fighter this time, uh, he said how like, and he's, he's a strong guy, like built to kind of be an inside fighter in a lot of ways, or at least built to be successful on the inside, right? Tough, strong, you have all that stuff and you're on the inside, you have less to worry about versus if you're like, you have a glass jaw, things like that. The inside can be a little bit more dangerous sometimes in a way. He said he felt like guys were stealing his oxygen from him, right? Felt like guy right there breathing and you're breathing. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit to be said for that, but it also might be from internal tension of the muscles, things like that. You're in close on someone, it's natural to tense up a little bit, to tighten up. Also, you're, like, your mind is like, dude, we're in the danger zone. It's easy after a while of boxing to be on the outside, to be away from people and <sighs> compose yourself, take a breather, because that person has to overcome four or five feet to get you, right? But if you're literally in the kitchen, right? Right on the inside where it feels like everything can get you, it's gonna be hard to sometimes relax, all right? So that's a big thing to focus on, focus on getting those breaths while you stay alert, right? Not lackadaisical, alert and relax. Uh, but remember though, this is that, think about how when you develop that, that can be used against your opponent. How? If they haven't done their homework, they haven't put in their practice on the inside, if they're not a versatile fighter, which again, you might run into someone like that, so don't take my word for it that, hey, this will always beat people, but a lot of boxers are not used to fighting on the inside. Over 50% of them, from my experience, are not. And if you get on the inside with them, they're gonna feel like you're stealing their oxygen. Oxygen, they're gonna be a little bit tighter, a little more stressed out, a little more panicky, and that's gonna do what? It's gonna tire them out. It's gonna make them make more mistakes. But at the very least, I've seen this play out time and time again. I'll have a guy that gets on the inside on someone that's not used to having someone on the inside of them. And uh, it's not even my guy's punches that beat down the person. It's that constant mental pressure of having somebody right there when you don't want them to be right there. All right, so there's a big advantage to that a lot of times. Uh, and then of course, that can set you up for shots and when you fight. When you're on the inside, basic good boxing advice is to get under the guy that you're boxing when you're on the inside. Don't let them get under you, all right? So if you're standing tall, I saw this play out the other day on an awesome pro box card. A guy, uh, undefeated prospect, 10 and 0, he lost his fight because on the inside, the boxer he was fighting got below him and he was up high. And he wasn't getting good leverage on his punches and is also, he's really open for shots to come up from down here where you can barely almost see them and get nailed by them, all right? So you wanna get lower. Now, very important note on getting lower. Don't get lower by bending your waist forward, all right? You can bend it a little bit to a side, maybe another side, but make sure you have your legs under you, the legs under your center of gravity. If you don't, it's gonna be very easy for a boxer to just push down on you, lean on you a little bit, and bam, claps you down. And there's almost nothing you can do about it besides correcting your stance and not leaning forward. And then also it opens you up for uppercuts as well if you lean forward, okay? And I'm not gonna tell you that, hey, you're never gonna get away with leaning forward. Guys get away with it all the time. But I see those guys meet somebody that's a little bit of a, a rough customer and makes their life difficult by either pushing down on them, maybe they'll slip a punch, like they'll slip a punch from that opponent and the opponent leaves the arm out and then controls them down things of that nature. And then also you're leaning forward, that's gonna make you a prime target for that uppercut. And uh, we don't wanna be a prime target. If you keep your stance neutral, where your weight is even more so most of the time, 
you're not gonna be susceptible to uppercuts. So it'll be very hard to hit you with a rear uppercut. And the lead uppercut is still gonna be hard to land as well. But the more you lean forward, the more you're just an easy recipient of the uppercut. So getting lower on the inside, very important for leverage, right? You're lower than someone, you have more leverage, you move them around, you're less of a target. It's hard for them to get leverage on their punches, and you can get maximal leverage on your punches the lower you are within reason. Uh, and so just remember all of those notes on that. Get inside, get a little bit lower. Don't rise up on the inside, because that makes you a prime target. And even great fighters that did that mistake, because again, it's funny, with talking more about boxing on this public forum, <laughs> you have people be like, oh, well, who are you to, to judge so-and-so, right? Well, it's just a fact of the matter, okay? Muhammad Ali was great, okay? A lot of people think he was the greatest heavyweight champion of all time, and you can make it, definitely make a huge case for that. Uh, now, can, can I talk about things that he made mistakes on? 100%. Does that mean I'm even a, a, a stain on Ali's shorts? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means it's simply that these are the ideas and the concepts and the art, as well as the scientific facts of boxing, that what works time and time again and what generally leads to poor results and you can succeed in spite of it, right? Ali succeeded in spite of having his chin up in the air and a lot of things, taking unnecessary punishment. But also there was a cost to be paid. The cost wasn't paid on the winning end that much, but it's paid on another end, on the human end, all right? So anyway little tangent there so you're on the inside right so we get that leverage we're a little bit lower we're a smaller target got more power now also this idea of if someone has good power on their shots some people a lot of people they need to get set to throw i know this was my scenario for a long time of me boxing was i felt like i had to like be in my position to throw my power shots and uh, if i wasn't i had to kind of get myself to that position to throw the power shots if you on the inside make little tiny steps off the one side or the other with your punches or even without your punches it can throw that guy off to think man i gotta set a little bit i gotta settle but now granted there are plenty of fighters that can throw out of position that's something that you need to work on being able to throw out of position there are plenty of fighters that can do that too so don't say that that's gonna be an all or nothing answer but it's something you can kind of notice with a fighter when you when you're going a couple rounds against him that okay he, he needs a little bit of time to get set that's where the movement on the outside can be so beneficial but if you're on the inside you can do the same thing with those little slight turns and it makes it difficult for him to pull the trigger all right and you can pull the trigger while he's trying to load his gun to pull the trigger it also creates little angles for you to land different shots from slightly different ways that are going to be hard to see when we're throwing these punches on the inside guys i see so often this type of thing where people are arm punching right their arms are the only thing moving <laughs> and they think it's wearing down their guy. It's really not. I mean, maybe if you have pro, you know, wraps on and smaller gloves, you know, if you're under 154 pounds or whatever, you have the eight ounces and above, you got the tens. Maybe it's like a little bit of wear and tear over 12 rounds. But if you got a reasonably tough guy, which, or gal, which most people that get to at least the higher level, right, are reasonably tough and all of that, and in shape, hopefully, that's not gonna do that much wear and tear on them. Now, that's where on the inside, if you want to have effective punches, you need to learn how to throw with your body. And it's like an obvious note, but it, it, it falls apart more, I, I see the closer people get to each other, right? For inside fighting. So if you're outside, it's easy to kind of produce some momentum and have the idea of like, yeah, like I'm throwing, I'm throwing something, I'm throwing a punch, I'm throwing a baseball. You have some space to do it. The closer you get, the more you feel like, I gotta be like, eh, 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 eh. Kind of like rabbit style punches. So how do we work on this, guys? Because the more you get better at this, the better well-rounded fighter you'll be, the more dangerous you'll be in every single area in that ring. Outside, mid-range, inside. Oh, they can't get away from you, man. They can't beat you on any one of those platforms. Gonna kill it. All right, so first off is obviously it all goes back to the foundation, which is shadow boxing. So shadow box throwing short punches where the primary focus is not really moving the arm to shadow box, but to move the body. Just a real quick example on using the arms. So if I'm shadow boxing on the inside, I'm using my arms, you'll see this. See, there's nothing here. There's no turn. So if anything, sometimes just practice on turning the body and then start putting punches with it. Minimal arm movement, but getting that good snap and violent twist is the way I like to say it. Violent twists of the shoulders and things like that 
to really get that because that's where that force is going to be produced and it's powerful think about how much weight is here on you know your your chest and core section midsection and hips and shoulders as well as your head by the way that's a little side note guys is that the more that chin can be down within reason the more the head i have a giant head but the more even no matter how big your head is is between about maybe 10 to 15 pounds of weight so the more that's up here while you're throwing, outside of that being uh, making you vulnerable to getting hit in the butt and things like that and getting hit in the throat, uh, it's gonna take away the leverage from your punches. The more you can get that chin down, and so therefore when you throw a punch, the head kind of moves with it while you still maintain you know, vision of your opponent, that is an extra 10 pounds or so behind your punch. Think about it, guys, that's a whole nother weight class. And that is how an easy trick I've seen guys maximize their power. Mid-range, inside, anywhere, is by keeping that head down a little bit. And sure, they might have knockout power without it. Gets even better with it, right? So a little side note tip on that. Now, uh, another way to work on becoming better at punching on the inside is to work on the bag, of course. It's a great tool. It's actually a great tool for it, uh, as long as you're not excessively leaning forward and things like that with your punches. Now, one interesting thing, and I can kind of hear the trolls right now, but you guys got to trust me on this, my experience, is doing like old school bag work. So you see these old school fighters, whether it's like Ezra Charles or Dirty Joe Walcott or just, I don't know, just name anybody from like the 40s, 50s, 60s, things like that. You see their hands are, are down a lot. And when they're hitting the bag, it's all coming from the shoulder rotation. There's none of this kind of just like boom, 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 boom. Everything's coming from that rotation. And granted, you could argue that you want to train how you fight. So doing that is going to train you to keep your hands down and you can definitely make a case for that. Now, where I think it though is important or a good thing to kind of build in is it does help teach your body for someone that's having trouble getting that concept. If you're having trouble, trouble getting that concept to get the body to deliver the punch and not the arm to deliver the punch. So you focus on not even moving the arms or move them as, limit, as limited as possible while still just connecting with the knuckles and it can really help prime you up to learn how to throw with your shoulders and your waist and twisting versus just arm extensions, all right? Also too, you throw with your arms, you're gonna tire yourself out a lot. You throw with your body, rotate the body, the arms aren't gonna get as tired, right? So if you ever feel just completely arm weary from fighting on the inside or boxing on the inside, sparring on the inside, that it could be that situation that you're overly arm punching versus focusing on just using the rotation of your shoulders and hips to produce your punches, to just deliver your punches. And you just gotta do a little squeeze at the end, pop, and that's all you need. And the last one as far as how to become better at throwing those shots, uh, the three inch hook concept or three inch punch we teach with like the left hook, the lead hook, but you can do this with almost any punch. You put it on the bag, like it just landed, pull it off about three inches, and then get that whip, where again, it's letting the body lead the arm and deliver the arm. The body goes first, the arm just slightly follows right afterwards. And of course that, that um, delay is minimized the more and more you're you know on the inside. And, but that's how you truly actually get the body with the punch versus if the arm leads every punch, especially a hook style shot, if it leads it and the body comes afterwards, the body is not actually with it, all right? Let's talk about some different concepts as far as more variety of punches, but also movement. Uh, when you're on the inside, shifting the head around, right? So whether that's going side to side, weaving under the arms or the head of your guy that you're under or gal, pulls to get around, right? Because you can have like a person's head right here. You pull to get around on one side. You pull a little bit to get on the other side. Also, you pull a little bit with the chin down to get past uppercuts and things like that. Just make sure when you pull, you keep your chin down. Don't make their job easy. Don't make, don't give them the opportunity to be lucky. Make it so they have to work to get any type of luck. Uh, and then also little bobs as well, going under shots. Also, all of these things work uh, together to mask punches, right? So you're getting on one side, throwing some shots, getting on the other side, and you're moving your head in between that, things like that. They, it's very hard to see when a shot's coming. That also leads to the previous point. The more you're throwing punches with your body versus your arm, the more that body motion and movement is going to look like punches. It's gonna get them reacting, getting, getting them to tighten up. It's gonna control their breathing. It's gonna short wire certain little plans they have. 
Because also think about it as well. If I'm over on this side on somebody and I'm doing some shots over there, they're working on, okay, I'm going to shoot him. He's on this side. Or if they anticipate me going back over, I maybe weave under and now they're trying to catch me going back under, over and I went under, right? So there's all those little things that make it so, okay, guy's here now on me. Okay, guy's over here. Look, what can I, he's over here. Oh, he's under me now, right? So all those little things, he did a little pull out. All those little things, the more you can make it erratic and random while also being smooth about it, the more successful you'll be. You'll hide the punches that are coming off of that movement. That's why guys are so successful with throwing off the of stuff like that you'll see in so many fights on the inside because he, can, he can't, it's very hard to see the punch coming, very hard. A few other things as well is to make a little bit of a space as well because sometimes when you're in close, you want just slightly more space to punch sometimes. You do need to learn how to throw with ultra tight sp uh, short spaces, but you can take a little slight step back, throw your shots, or even just move one foot back just a little bit to create a little bit more space for your shots. And this can, again, create different ranges on that inside while you're still there, right? And then also allow you to develop a little bit more leverage sometimes on your punches because you sometimes, there, there's the optimal range for the maximum power of a punch. And obviously if you're super ultra close, you can make it hard and produce a lot of power and hurt people, and knock people up. People have done it. but it will be a little bit harder versus if kind of reaches that maximal or almost perfect range to get enough momentum on a punch. Let's talk about the types of punches we're throwing on the inside. Now you can throw any punch on the inside basically, besides obviously maybe not quite a jab. You could maybe do a jab if someone's like leaning back, things like that, but, or you're gonna do it as kind of like a controlling punch, but it's gonna be hard to produce some power on that punch uh, and enough force, but you have the mass variety of body shots and uppercuts those are things that are wide open on the inside. Most of the time with most people, how they stand on the inside, all right? So those are the punches that typically are gonna land the most. And that's where also you need to think about this when you're on the inside to protect the body, to protect the body. And the other thing I said, uppercuts, protect for uppercuts. So if you're getting nailed by uppercuts, besides adjusting for your stance, it might be a situation where you're leaning forward excessively or being squared, right? It's nothing, being squared. If you're square on the inside, you're also open for more punches. Also, it's oftentimes hard to throw punches properly. But the more sided up you are, the more you keep your weight even and you're getting creamed by uppercuts on the inside, dude, just put your hand there. Just put your hand there and then you're stopping the body shots, you're stopping the uppercuts. I know what you might be thinking, oh, well now you're open for head shots. Well, guess what? The head can move. The head can pull around like we talked about and go under, you know, it can go side to side, but you have this here, those uppercuts that can be hard to see because that hand, there, your opponent's hand is like right there on your face. So it can just pop you at any time. And uh, if you're getting nailed by them, put it there. And uh, until the guy has an answer for it, keep it there. And also remind me of another punch that is an esoteric punch, but it's still an important punch to know how to throw on the inside. It's a powerful shot when done right. This punch was developed, at least from my knowledge, from Kid Gavilan, the Cuban hawk. And he said he developed this punch by chopping down sugarcane in Cuba. But it's the bolo punch, right? And I'm not talking about the wide, you know, showy, fun, whatever thing, but I'm talking about the actual use of it where you roll it around a little bit and you'll be amazed with just a little bit of practice and timing, how you can generate a lot of force on this punch from short range. And it can be, and again, if you're not just like continuously doing it nonstop, it'll be hard to kind of see that it's coming, right? So you throw different shots, different shots, and then you mix that into the mix, powerful shot. Maybe I got a note on this one. So often on the inside, I'll have fighters where they're inside and their hand is right below someone's jaw. Let's say it's their left hand or the right hand and it's right below their opponent's jaw. And my guy isn't working. And it's like, man, you got a shot right there. The hand is where the head is. And if the hand is where the head is, we should be able to do something about it, right? Jackhammer is what I like to call it. Be like a jackhammer, not going down with it, but going up with it but you're jackhammering his head up, bam, 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 to get that head up, not only to make him uncomfortable, but also it gets your it gets their head up now and you get a chance to take their head off or you go for the body, you go for anything off of it. But at the very least, it's gonna make them uncomfortable on the inside, which is, again, it's gonna do what? It's gonna frustrate them, tire them out, things like that, throw them off their game, and that's all good stuff for you as long as you land scoring punches off of it, right? So jackhammering the head up, Beautiful, annoying as heck thing if you ever had anyone do it to you, but be that same person <laughs> when you're on the inside with someone. Be that guy that 
no one wants to deal with on the inside and you'll be a pretty successful fighter. Also as well, pushing up with the uppercut. So we're always trying to, it's funny, I teach, of course, all the time, like any good boxing coach, don't push your punches. Yes, that's 100% correct. This is the one scenario, or two really, you know, this situation is where you might want to push the shot a little bit. So again, that hand is under that jaw, under that head, and not everyone has their head locked in tight and their neck muscles all contracted all the time on the inside. If they are, they're gonna be burning themselves out. And you don't, you, you don't try to snap their head up. You can, but you don't even necessarily try to. You just push their head up. You push their head up with the idea of you're gonna take it off, all right? Push it up, take it off. Push it up, take it off. Great concept. Try it the next time you spar, guy, spar guys. Great move. And then as well, off of throwing punches on the inside sometimes, whether it's a hook, uppercut like I said, leaving it out there and controlling them with it, right? These are kind of like little, little tips on the inside, but again, I've seen them work so well, where you throw a punch, short right hand, a left hook, and you leave it out there, push them a little bit, control them, and hit them off of it. And again, you're gonna get them off balance. And if they're off balance, it's gonna be hard for them to return a punch, and it's your opportunity to give them a punch after that. Then, as well, with our punch selection, mixing the uh, hook to the body, and then uppercut, right? It's so like that Mike Tyson style combo, right hook to the body, right uppercut, or left hook to the body, left uppercut, or the opposite of that, like a right uppercut, and a left hook to the body on the opposite side. There is, again, this fight card I saw the other uh, last week or whatever, that two fights got stopped with the right uppercut and the body shot. Left hook to the body, liver shot. Great opening, great setup. Uh, then doubling up on the same side, right? Because if you got somebody, if you're always throwing right, left, right, left, right, left, that's the most rookie thing you can do. And then combine that with throwing at the same timing, right? So you're right, left, right, left, right, left. And you can play a metronome to that beat. It's gonna be easy for your opponent to guess what? Time you, ba, 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 ba. They can do anything to stop those punches or at least take off a little bit of the punch. So you wanna not only change your timing up on your punches, so ba, 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 ba. You know, just mix it up. <laughs> not quite making music, but kinda. Uh, but then also, just simply doubling up with the same hand. So you can keep the same timing even, but if you just double up, triple up on one side, right, left, right, left, right, left, and then right, 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 left, left, right, right, left, right, left, that's gonna be much harder. And then you're mixing in the body and the head with that, making your life even more difficult. And that's what you wanna do, and you're gonna land shots. One thing I love on the inside is someone's kinda having the low lead arm, and they're rolling with the right hand and blocking the hook is to do a right uppercut for the body or a right hook for the body and then come back with that short right hand because they're expecting the left hook afterwards, they'll open up right into it. And then as well as off of the right, left, right, mixing in not just like a straight right, left hook, straight right, left hook, or right hook, left hook, right hook, left hook, right hook, left hook, mixing that uppercut because as they're rolling with those shots a little bit, they expect the left hook, but instead it's a left uppercut and that pops their chin up, lands clean, and then again, don't be satisfied with just popping their chin up, take it off with something else, all right? So often on the inside, we'll, we'll either get lucky or we'll set up something properly, you know, we'll hook the body, uppercut, boom, head pops up, and then we don't finish the job. Finish the job, finish punching in the codes, it's gonna end the game. Going high and low with the same side, that's another classic great move. The left hook up high, left hook for the liver. Bam, bam, gets the arm up a little bit, opens up that liver shot, bam. Remember on the right side, or rather on the left side of someone's body, which is gonna be your right hook punches, the liver's not over there, gang, okay? And before anyone says kidney punch, kidney punch is illegal, that's on the back, like all the way on the back. So you have this organ, the liver, you touch it just right, you reveal it and take it, you're gonna hurt no matter who they are, the toughest guy ever. There's that adage, like if you can't hurt them to the head, go for that body. And it doesn't matter how blockheady the guy is and how tough they are, that's gonna hurt him. On the inside, think about defensively, right? So I talk about the weaves and dips and pulling out with the chin down. Also as well, as well as little side steps and things like that, use your shoulders on the inside, guys. And we all know the shoulder roll concept. And we all know that from classic boxing, not just from Floyd Mayweather, right? Uh, from across the Midwest all the way to the East Coast, and probably in California too. Anyway, we know roll, rolling with the lead shoulder, but also rolling with the rear shoulder. On the inside, it's an easy time to do that. You can even kind of roll, and it will cut off the uppercut on that side from hitting you. 
but mix that into your arsenal. If that shit is down, that's a beautiful way to deflect some punches and set up other punches for yourself just so, so you have versatility. Because again, we're protecting that body, we're rolling, so it's gonna be hard for them to set up, for instance, a high-low. If they hook up high for you and then down, and then your arm's down there, you didn't raise it up to block a hook up top, it's gonna be hard to hit you. So just mix that into your arsenal as well as with the head movement, things of that nature. It just makes you a slippery guy, makes you hard to hit, and it's a very energy efficient move. It also sets you up to throw some good shots off of it. Now, oh, here's, here's a great one, guys. When they go low, you go high. They go down for that body. Remember, every time they throw a body shot, their head opens up. Every time they throw a head shot, their body opens up. All right, so remember that, but on that inside, what are guys gonna do? They're gonna try body shots most of the time because that's where they feel like they can get something. They go down for that body, you hit them on the same exact side, basically right when that shot comes. Just keep the elbow in a little bit if you're a little worried about it getting through. But if you got your timing right, you can rip it before the shot comes uh, or right afterwards. And again, think about it, you control their head. If someone tries to hit you hard and you are snapping their head at the same time, you're gonna take away the power of their shot. All right, beautiful, beautiful counter. So remember, they're going for the body, the head's right there for you. Take it, take it, wide open. Uh, now, to wrap up, let's talk about if things don't work out, right? You're on the inside and they're tying you up and the ref is not enforcing, not excessive tying up, okay? Because, again, just to roll back to this great Pro Box, Pro Box card that I saw, if you haven't seen it, it's a great one, April 24th, 2024 on Pro Box, great card, three fights, all three fights were super competitive and very entertaining, all right? You won't you won't be uh, sorry you spent a little bit of time watching it. With the refs in those fights in Florida, I don't know what it is, but I noticed a pattern. They were enforcing the rules of boxing. Guys were grabbing on the back of people's head, stop that. Guys were trying to tie up, stop that. And uh, so I bet you in the, in the pre-fight meeting, they made it explicit, hey, if you do this, if you do this, if you break these rules, we're gonna take points. And no, you're not the cash cow or the golden goose or whatever, and we're gonna actually do it, all right? Just so you know. And therefore, you didn't get much of that, which made, guess what? For great fights. Because if we wanna watch clinching and things like that, we can watch Muay Thai, we can watch jujitsu tournaments, wrestling tournaments, things like that, if we wanna watch a form of grappling, all right? And again, I'm not doubting on all those things, but it's just, these rules are in boxing for a reason, to make boxing boxing. So you get tied up, right? So if, someone, if you have your arm, let's say you shot a hook, or you just reached out by mistake, like I see my guys do sometimes, that arm is out there. Put the thumb down and bring it around to you. Don't try to yank it out, pull it out, get all tight and crazy. Just get that arm close to you around to the front of their body, and now you have leverage to just pull it up or to twist your body a little bit to the side to just break it right out of that hold, and then you can go to work with it, all right? Same thing on the other side. And then as well, if someone's grabbing on the back of your head like this, well, guess what? Their body's wide open. And if you're not excessively leaning forward, it's gonna be hard for them to control you that much for at least the first few moments of it. Rip your hardest body shots you got. And remember as well that when their hands are out, it's away from, like I said, their body, but also their face. So some guys will do a great clinch game where they will keep their elbows in and wrap your head up right there and just like this. But remember, they're like this, and yes, they're controlling your head, but if you can have your base with you to the best of your abilities, you can at least make their job difficult if the ref isn't calling them on it and their head is right there to be taken. Do your best to throw with your shoulders and not your arm punch, which is gonna be hard to do because they're controlling your head. But you can do it to a certain degree. And of course, in a fight, the gloves are a little bit smaller, things like that, and you can produce a little bit more power. All right, and, and again, trying to be as loose as you can and snapping it with a good hard shoulder jerk, you can get some good power on it, make them not wanna do that. And then once they let go for a moment, you gotta light them up with everything else. One thing that I didn't note on yet to wrap up is they got an underhook situation on you, lifting you up. You can work shots off of that, all right? So keep that in mind, it's possible to work shots off of that. But then also, as well, if someone has you kinda all the way up here, under, and you're really having a tough time getting anything going, you can get this arm up, bring it, side yourself up so you got a little bit more space because the moment you put that shoulder in, like I talked about earlier, you have more space now. Slide that elbow in, right? And then now it's in, so now their hand is there. You went from being here to siding up, got it through here, and now 
you can shoot some shots, get some work done at least, and at least make their life hard and difficult. All right, guys. I didn't go over everything on the inside, but what I focused on was the lowest hanging fruit, the stuff that I think will make the biggest dramatic change in your game, whether you're a beginner, amateur boxer, or even mid-low level pro boxer. You plug some of this stuff in, some of the things you might've forgot, maybe you, you missed, right? Maybe you weren't there that day in school when it was taught, <laughs> just kidding. But plug it in guys and put it in your training and trust me, you'll become an excellent inside fighter. If you like this video, make sure you click like, share with someone that you think might benefit from it. If you have any comments, questions, thoughts, please drop it below and look out for the next video, guys.